like to acknowledge the First Nations people of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eurora Nation and the others who walk through these lands. And I acknowledge and honour the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who are the first custodians of the land on which I work and live, the beautiful Yarra Valley. I acknowledge the voices of those who are not here but yearn to be truly heard. Sister Shizu Philo Hirota, the only woman and non-ordained member of the Synod on Synodality Organising Committee, says, Synodality is a radically inclusive call to not leave anybody behind. The Synod is participatory, collegial, grounded in and energised by the creative spirit of God affirming the non-violent impulse of listening dialogue and working through differences. From this perspective, the Synod can be understood as a global non-violent practice to foster a more non-violent church and world. The church must be more comfortable with open-ended questions and that being able to live with questions unanswered and problems unsolved, but still feeling peace is an essential part of synodality or walking together as the whole church. So truth-telling belongs in this vision of a healthy contemporary church. Without truth-telling, we risk meandering on our journey, forgetting that it's the Holy Spirit who guides us and enlightens our minds. So in my keynote, we'll explore the theological foundations of truth-telling in a practical way through these conference themes, action and experiential learning and creating space for the spirit, affirming the good work already being done and live and concrete examples. And Shane will continue this with a look at the church's institutional exercise of synodality. Now, since the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, the Catholic Church has theologically understood itself, ourselves, as dialogical. Pope Paul VI explicitly linked this with our need for a deepening self-knowledge and a heroic and impatient struggle for renewal. And here I resonated with Dean's words this morning. He said, we don't do things separately Truth-telling is woven through everything. Therefore, let's consider truth-telling as being one aspect of a holistic process of dialogue within a context of reconciliation, healing, renewal and mission. As a home for truth-telling, Pope Francis explains that synodality is not a plan or a program to be implemented, but a style to be adopted that listens to the spirit through the word of God, prayer and adoration. He says the spirit is the protagonist and the synod is, this, the event of the synod is an ecclesial moment, not a parliament or an investigation into opinions but an ecclesial moment whose protagonist is the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit, there is no synod. In this sense, truth-telling is not simply arguing or seeking to win. It's not preordained. Neither an agenda nor the output can be set without a communal understanding of what is needed and some sort of process that we heard Dean speaking about. And nor is it purely a human exercise, but rather our participation in the spirit of truth. So let's examine some contemporary examples of truth-telling. Uh, all, you all have people who would come to mind as being prophetic and powerful in truth, and I smiled when I saw the young people and what they shared with us um, from the Art HQ this morning as being prophetic and powerful in truth. 
So these, this list of people are those who are most meaningful to me. Greta Thunberg, who at the United Nations headquarters told world leaders, yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And Grace Tame, accepting the Australian of the Year Award, she told Australia, trauma does not discriminate, nor does it end when the abuse itself does. First Nations people, people with disabilities, the LGBTIQ community and other marginalised groups face even greater barriers to justice. Every voice matters. Just as the impacts of evil are borne by all of us, so too solutions are born of us all. And Debbie Edwards, a pastoral worker in a parish of abuse, one of many who deserves greater recognition and support. And the art of Gracie Morbitzer and Kerry Lattimore. An interview tells our Gracie Morbitzer was always fascinated by the saints. Here's her painting of Hildegard of Bingham. She calls them the original social justice warriors and is fascinated by their humanity and tendency to push religious boundaries. She says they were always sort of stirring things up and it got some of them excommunicated at first. People didn't believe them. They thought they were crazy or wanted to cast them out because they were causing too much trouble. I love that about them because they thought differently than other people in their time and place. Kelly Lattimore's icon, Mama, depicts a dying Jesus who resembles George Floyd and is held by his mother Mary. It was stolen twice from the Catholic University of America. He also received death threats for this depiction. The many leaders who have been involved in the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the Voice to Parliament. The Australian Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. And finally, those who work for the new voices and new spaces that Catholics have found in Australia, uh, particularly over the last few years. Now, these examples illustrate for us some of the key elements of truth-telling. It's a feature of human authenticity. It's not restricted to being Catholic or even Christian. Courageous and provocative it can be received as uncomfortable, unattractive, and even repulsive. Empowering. The power of bold speech and its impact on the listener is a call to conversion. From darkness to light, from comfort to activity. And again, I just connected so well with Dean this morning, from perceiving a real complexity and a, and a mass of information and confusion into clarity. If the call is taken up, it empowers rather than crushing or alienating. Truth-telling operates through the power of paresia, which is defined as bold, honest and free speech. In the earliest months of his pontificate, Pope Francis turned the tables on the usual bland undertakings of the Synod of Bishops' Assembly when he told them, after the last consistory in which the family was discussed, a cardinal wrote to me saying, what a shame that several cardinals did not have the courage to say certain things out of respect for the Pope perhaps believing the Pope might believe something else, might think something else. This is not good. This is not synodality because it is necessary to say all that in the Lord one feels the need to say without polite deference 
without hesitation. And at the same time, one must listen with humility and welcome with an open heart what your brothers say. Synodality is exercised with these two approaches. And in summary, speak with Parisia and listen with humility. So what is the theological understanding of Parisia? And may it be an expression of truth? Let's explore this through a brief look at two categories of truth-telling. Prophetic, prophetic Parisia, and the cry of the poor. So prophetic speech. It's not merely the act of speaking, but speech that arises out of a person's, person's being when they are being authentic. And an authentic person forms their conscience through the practice of being attentive, being intelligent, being reasonable, being responsible, and being loving. This is the natural exercise of our consciousness. So each of the people I gave as examples demonstrate a conscience which seeks to be attentive, intelligent, and reasonable, and which is driven to express truth in speech and deed and therefore being responsible and loving. So let our prophets demonstrate. In being attentive, a vast consultation was undertaken by that Royal Commission. The Commission's website holds 29,620 documents and 3,928 videos of personal stories. Being open to listening and learning with the heart and the mind was the beginning of the journey for the commissioners to understand. For victim survivors, being listened to, perhaps for the first time, was the beginning of the journey of justice. Being intelligent. So what's really happening here? What further data do I need? What will the consequences be if I act in a certain way? How do I best care for this person in this situation? Should I just shut my mouth and listen? Now, I deeply admire the skills and sensitivities of pastoral workers like my friend Debbie Edwards. The questions they ask around people's spiritual and holistic welfare are being intelligent. Their wisdom lies in being open to another person's experience and gently responding. Deb worked in a parish deeply wounded by several abusive clerics sexual abuse, financial and abuse of conscience. As the leadership team, together with our new priest, moved towards understanding both context and consequences, suggestions came for symbols and prayers that recognised a multifaceted betrayal of trust. They could be introduced to the liturgy and the newsletter, perhaps regularly. But before people got too excited, Deb spoke quietly. There has been more suffering amongst the parish people than others are aware of. It is private and painful, and some consider the mass and the church building to be a refuge. It would hurt them even to have a prayer of the faithful mentioning abuse. Now, such pastoral care was the reasonable response to that parish's needs at that time. It illustrates the priestly aspect of the vocation of all the baptised as priestly, prophetic, royal people, something we can all enter into. A responsible person has a sense of, a sense of justice, a sense of responsibility, repentance, awe of our creator, joy. Being authentic provides space for the spirit because having a sense of is our awareness of the spirit's movement within. We may sense it in others, even if they can't name it. A prophetic truth teller does not point to themselves, but to something bigger. We heard that in the stories of Mum Sherl and Sister Tess and in Dean Parkin's words. They tell the truth and invite others in but they don't 
hold the truth like a weapon to be wielded. I once asked a religious sister what poverty is and she said it's like being this instead of like this. Maybe this is the poor in spirit of the Beatitudes when we offer the spirit of truth. Greta Thunberg's refrain is listen to the science. She points to a source that is reliable and trustworthy. A Christian prophet points to God, the source of all truth telling, the ultimate truth who is love, a relationship, not a possession. These are powerful people. It is their listening to the cry within and the cries of others. Their intelligence recognises the truth that they hear. They are reasonable and therefore open to new data and information. And they burn with responsibility. The spirit drives them. And I heard a bit of this at morning tea. That's why you're here. Above all and perfecting all, they strive to be loving, humble, gentle, wise and prudent. And I love this image. I wonder if you've seen it. Um, I think it was 2019, a delegation of leaders of factions from Sudan visited the Vatican and they were representing groups that fought each other. What do you say to leaders in this situation? The Pope kissed their feet and it's a beautiful reaction from the woman there. If you want a photo representing conversion and transformation, I think it's, it's a snapshot. So in the spirit, how do we discern the truth when there's so many voices contending for our attention? Well, good and kind judgment take time. It is reasonable and indeed responsible to say, I don't have enough information to form an opinion yet. And it's a good sign to be willing to change your mind. In the loud, confusing landscape of social media and newspapers and articles and opinions, it's helpful to look for the presence of authenticity in an individual and for the fruits of the spirit. If the words are intended to divide people or to set up boundaries, then they're not truth-telling. The speaker may have glimpsed the edge of an issue, but not the substance of the reality. So we may observe that person and their words, but do not give their words authority in our own consciences. We should test whether we use the gifts of the spirit when we speak. Sometimes the power of the spirit lies in our silence offered to another or, of course, simply reducing the thoughtlessness of our speech. The truth of a prophet's words is recognised by others who are likewise attentive, intelligent, reasonable, responsible and loving. This is dialogue. That's when it really clicks. And so it's not... The definition of dialogue isn't we come to an agreement and, and we completely agree on a topic. It's offering your genuine self to another and having a response back from them, even though their experience may be different. Therefore, there will always be an essential element of conversion, a movement within you, less exercise of authenticity and a smaller horizon of interest brings a need for greater conversion. A prophet offers the truth to others in trust. Dean said this, we gave it to you. We believe in you. They trust that the power of the spirit that they sense will inflame the hearts and minds of others too. The truth-telling of the cry of the poor. From Laudate Si. 
These situations have caused Sister Earth, along with all the abandoned of our world, to cry out, pleading that we take another course. We are called to be instruments of God our Father so that our planet might be what he desired when he created it and correspond with God's plan for peace, beauty and fullness. The problem is we still lack the culture needed to confront this crisis. Pope Francis explains that, one, the cry of the poor is inextricably entwined with the cry of the earth, and two, those who hear that cry must be moved, transformed into a new, more responsible way of being together, a culture of integral ecology, he calls it. And this perceives the interconnectedness of all creation and works for justice in all aspects of life. Now, our prophets don't aim to please or placate. We know that truth-telling is not always easy to hear. The cry of the poor is not and should not be demure, polite, well-educated and articulate and not disturbing of others' comfort. Um, I came across a little history essay about the suffragette movement and the writer said, don't forget, these women threw rocks through glass windows and firebombed places. Don't forget it. And there will be consequences. John the Baptist on a plate. Um, I have a list of what I think is needed for truth-telling in a church that values prophetic dialogue and what do you think. And I'm running out of time. I want to be polite to Shane, so I'll go through the list and you'll get these slides later so you can mull on it. Training where process is carefully crafted and we avoid placing our problems to the fore. Open hearts and minds. Space for the spirit to breathe, including prayer, beauty, singing, and quiet. Permission to speak. Radical listening. Patience. A pastoral approach. And building partnerships and friendships. I'll just throw in a few theological words within a context of conversion and reconciliation and discernment. In other words, if we miss some of these elements, you're not getting the full package. And building a synodal culture of communion, participation and mission. Um, and I scribbled down joy. And in conclusion, a key message for a synodal church for us is the transformation as God's activity will be welcome and effective when Christian communities are committed to a culture of conversion. Such a culture does not shy from the challenge and the power of truth-telling. And to me, that sounds like an authentic and missionary people. Thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, everyone. I was pleased that Alyssa described uh, what I'm going to talk about as the church's exercise of synodality in this process, that uh, this journey that Pope Francis has invited us all onto. Important to remember, it doesn't start with the General Assembly in October. It started back in 2021, just as the Plenary Council that we had here was a four-year journey. It wasn't just by any means the two assemblies. It is an exercise in synodality, both in the straightforward sense that it's an exercise, it's something that we're doing, but it's also an exercise in the sense of training. It's an exercise in the sense of practice, learning and teaching. So just as the Plenary Council, I think, was for us in Australia, uh, an exercise, a training exercise in, uh, in operating differently and has affected the way that we, uh, that we have operated and I think very much and very helpfully affected our expectations and our capacity for how we operate into the future. So that's true on a worldwide scene in what Pope Francis is inviting us to uh, in this journey of synodality. 
It's a journey which is very much one uh, that is related to truth-telling. Uh, but we need to hear that and think about what that means in a church context, in our context as Jesus' disciples. Certainly, it means and it begins with listening to each other and it ensuring that there is space for all the voices to be heard. And that's why the Plenary Council and similarly the Synod began with uh, a very widespread um, process for consultation. But it's important that, that while that's the starting point, that that's not the end point. We go on from there because the truth that we're ultimately interested in and the truth that we're listening for in the voices that we hear from each other is God's truth. That's the truth that we're seeking. And so truth-telling, truth-seeking in, uh, in the church is a process of discernment. It's a prayerful process. It's always in the context of prayer, guided by, guided by prayer, and listening not only to one another, but listening for the Holy Spirit who speaks in the voices of one another and, and call and invites us to hear God's truth and to recognise it and to proclaim it and therefore to act on it. So those three things go together really well in, a, in our church context. Truth-telling, perhaps truth-seeking, uh, synodality, and mission. So a few of the things I want to say about synodality uh, I'll be able to move through quickly because Alyssa has covered them so well. Uh, so some of these introductory things. Synodality is about a way of being church. It's not about a structure in the church, first of all, a structure of synods or councils or whatever. They're about what they allow us to do and, the, and what they enable in our life together as church. A, dis a dynamic of discerning and listening together, listening to one another and discerning, seeking to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. So what does a synodal church look like then? What are some characteristics of a synodal church? A synodal, a synodal church is one that walks together. That's the literal meaning of synod. Uh, and many people have pointed to synodality as in some way seeking to put some, bo put some flesh on the ecclesiological bones that were set out by Vatican II, giving us structures that allow us to be the pilgrim people of God who are, who are called into communion with one another and with God and who are undertaking a pilgrimage, who are moving together, recognising the God who walks with us, called into that communion in our baptism, and on a journey, not just wherever we might happen to wander, but on a journey that is a mission, that is entrusted uh, to us by God and guided by the Holy Spirit. So the communion, first of all, and the foundation for the communion that we enter into as the baptised is, is the communion within the Trinity itself, the communion between Father, Son and Spirit. That's the communion that we enter into. That's what makes us the people of God on this pilgrimage. That's what, uh, that's the mission ultimately that we share in is God's mission, Jesus' mission entrusted to us. Uh, the reference there is synodality. It's the International Theological Commission's document uh, on synodality, I think, in the life and mission of the church is the title of it from 2018, written in 2000, well, came to its final form 2017, published in 2018. Excellent, excellent document in terms of a background on synodality. So some of the things that Pope Francis says uh, and Alyssa has referred to, in that context of discernment and of mission and of communion, this is, not, this is different from a process of uh, seeking to debate ideas, to come up with a consensus or to do some horse trading uh, or to see who can attract the most votes. 
This is about an expression of who we are as a church that journeys together to understand reality with the eyes of faith and with the heart of God. To understand reality with the eyes of faith and with the heart of God. That's why we talk about discernment as part of this process. Not a parliament that's trying to reach a consensus or work out what deal can we get through here. Uh, or a common accord by taking a course to negotiation. It's about together opening ourselves to the Holy Spirit, recognising the Holy Spirit that acts in all of the baptised. That's the basis for that sensus fidei. So we come, as Alyssa pointed it out, out to us, I think with the three key attitudes, the three key practices that are part of synodality. Apostolic courage, speaking courageously, that's the parhasia that Alyssa was pointing to. With evangelical humility, a preparedness to listen and to learn. And doing all of that inspired by and guided by our, our prayer and our prayer together. So with courage, humility, being aware I haven't got all of the answers. I need to speak out of my experience, but I don't have all the answers, uh, and doing that in the context of prayer. So a synodal church is one that listens, in, listens to all the voices in order to listen to the Holy Spirit. Does that in a spirit of prayer, grounded in liturgy and the word of God. It's a way of being the church. It, the adjective works much better, or an adverb, if you like. Uh, it's the way of being church. Not, and within that, we have particular events that we call synods or councils uh, or whatever. It's something we can only do together in communion. And it's something that we need to participate in together. Discernment is a shared activity. Uh, so it involves participation and it is directed towards something, to renewing our prophetic witness to the human family. Hence those three aspects of synodality that Pope Francis has proposed for us, communion, participation and mission. So the idea of speak boldly and listen humbly. This is So this is uh, uh, from the beginning of the Synod on Young People in 2018, Pope Francis, again, encouraging, exhorting all of the participants to speak courageously, to speak what is on their mind, to speak frankly, frankly, but also to, uh, to uh, see that the, that the corresponding attitude to that courageous speaking is a humble listening that that's the path to dialogue. Dialogue is not a room full of people speaking courageously. Uh, that doesn't work very well if all you've got is people speaking courageously. We've all been there. Uh, we also need to have a space for listening, for listening humbly. And both of those uh, are guided by the Holy Spirit. What we're called to speak what we're called to point to, but also what we're, what we're called to hear. Uh, it's only together that we hear everything that's being said in and through the various voices that are there. So this dialogue, this, uh, this listening to one another in a context where people can speak, is a process of discernment, seeking to recognise God's action amongst us. We reflected that really well, I think, in the plenary council prayer that we prayed over and over again over those years. Give us the courage to tell our stories and to speak boldly of your truth. Give us ears to listen humbly to each other and a discerning heart to hear what you are saying. So how did that work out at the plenary council? Well, <laughs> it wasn't straightforward. <laughs> some of you might recognise, some of you might be in that photo, I'm not sure. Uh, this is Wednesday. This is morning tea on Wednesday at the Plenary Council. It's uh, after the deliberative vote has been announced on the decrees uh, for of the initial version of the uh, motions around uh, witnessing to the equal dignity of women and men. That was a moment of crisis. It was a moment of uh, great disappointment, 
great heartache, great hurt, anger, uh, of not being sure what we do next. But we did do something next, and we ended up that that, as we look back, and as I look back on it now, uh, more and more, I realise what what a pivot point that was and something more of the dynamics that were going on both before that and after that. Because in moving forwards, not only did we find a way forward in relation to uh, the motions on this area, on uh, witnessing to the equal dignity of women and men, it actually changed substantively the, uh, the quality of the dialogue and indeed the outcomes of the uh, of the decisions that we made about the remaining four areas that we were looking at. So what made that difference? What allowed that dialogue to actually enter a new phase? First, I think there was a shared commitment to ensure that there was a positive outcome. Uh, it was very clear across the room that everybody was determined that the failed vote could not be the last word on this topic. Uh, and so there was a shared commitment that somehow we needed to move forward. Uh, then there was certainly courageous speaking, which was not just about speaking loudly or boldly. Uh, one of the things that happened in that moment, I think, was people, and uh, and this was from all sides, because there was uh, there were passionate, passionate feelings, passionately held views and experiences, uh, both for uh, in support of the text as they'd been put, and against them. And everybody had been had been affected viscerally by uh, by those experiences and the failed vote uh, highlighted that enormously. And as I look back, part of what happened, like there'd been plenty of discussion leading up to the vote and people had spoken with great generosity, with great commitment to the process. But to some extent, it had been a speaking from the head, an exchange of ideas. This is what I thought. This is what I think. This is what I thought when I read the documents. This is what I brought with me that I want to say. This is what it's really important that you hear that I'm saying. And the dialogue after that shifted. People spoke in a much, uh, in a way that was the content wasn't much different. But people spoke much more, I think, from the heart in a way that was very vulnerable, that put themselves on the line in whatever the experience they were coming from, both for and against various, uh, various parts of the text. People spoke about the lived experience of how they were affected by various parts of the, uh, of the text and uh, of the proposals, not just what they thought about them. And that was heard, that was received. So there was humble listening, listening that was uh, that was open to conversion. And conversion that Alyssa was talking about means being being open to moving, ending up in a different spot from where you started, thinking differently about something, seeing something differently, seeing other people differently. By the end of that week the way that people who were still disagreeing about uh, about their approach to various things or their views on various things, seeing the different perspective and hearing them articulate that different perspective on other people who had, they had been in dialogue with was really very moving, very powerful. So part of that is listening from the heart, I think, rather than listening and thinking, now, what am I going to say? What's wrong about this? And how am I going to prove this? Uh, prove, what am I going to say in response to this? What's my counter argument going to be? And that's tough. If we're open to learning, that means that we're prepared to contemplate letting go of what we, of what we thought uh, beforehand. It's a costly listening. I think a humble listening is a costly listening. Hearing someone speak from the depths of how they're affected and being prepared to be shifted myself is costly. So in the end, 
If you look at the initial text and the one that we finally uh, agreed on, the content didn't change a great deal. There were there were a range of uh, adjustments, uh, and I think in uh, in many respects some improvements. What changed was I think the most important thing that changed was that people felt heard, and they appreciated the significance of what other people were saying differently from what they had before then. So, what did we learn about dialogue from the Plenary Council? First, dialogue is a process of learning. It's not a process of trying to convince someone. It's not a process of arguing. It's a process where the, where the primary goal that I go in with is to learn. It's a process of conversion, being open to the Holy Spirit and where the Holy Spirit might lead us. One of the things I learned particularly, I think, is that it's really important not to rush to decision making, not to rush to the finish line just because that's what we've got in the timetable. There, there was a real sense as we moved on and as we let go a bit more of uh, the carefully planned timetable that we'd laboured over, uh, that we needed to give the space that was needed to uh, to the discerning, to the decision-making, uh, that it didn't make sense to be calling votes until it was clear that we had found a way forward. Voting in general, I don't, I'm not a fan of voting, and I'm not sure that in this context uh, it it belongs in the context of dialogue, in the context of discernment, or to the extent that it has to be there at some points. Uh, it, it should be a formalising. It works best as a formalising of a consensus that's already been become clear and is agreed on. The problem with voting is it ends up uh, so often adversarial for and against. Please don't go to uh, plunge at Yuxtamodum. For and against uh, is bad enough. And whoever wins, wins. Uh, you know, what do you do? What do you do with what's left over? And the people who uh, who don't win, the views that don't win, have we run the the prospect of losing both those people, but also perhaps some of the worthwhile things that they might be articulating. So, in general, I'd say in our church processes, we should avoid voting as much as possible. Interestingly, we're about to have one of our, uh, every six months we have a meeting of the, the bishops nationally, and we're about to have that. I was very surprised going into that. We seldom have votes at the bishops' conference. We do when we need to, when we need to actually formalise a, a decision. But for the most part, we discuss through until the point that we're, that we've arrived at a consensus. And when there's a vote, it's a bit of a formality. Um, and when it's not, that means we've got something wrong. An important thing uh, I want to talk about, and this is sort of the last major thing, but I, I uh, get into it a, a few different ways. The circularity of dialogue. This is something that I've reflected on uh, more, more recently. And it's part of, I think, the learning that we're finding in the, plan in the, uh, in the synodal uh, process uh, as it unfolds. So there's uh, one of the things that the that the International Theological Commission's uh, paper talks about is the circularity of the census fidei. In some other uh, parts of the documents, uh, it talks about restitution. I think restitution is just an appalling choice of word, not like the church to get its words wrong. But um, especially in English translations. But the, when I first read this and I saw the circularity, I thought, oh, yeah, that's a nice idea. But seeing what that actually means and the impact that it can have, I think, has been really worthwhile. So the circularity of the census for day with which all the faithful are in doubt. So we need to recognise the, the wisdom, the Holy Spirit that acts in all those who are baptised. Uh, and draw on the co-responsibility that all have within, while still recognising the various and particular roles that individuals have. So uh, it calls for us in our local church and on every level 
to uh, to do things that uh, that provide for and strengthen the circular relationship between the various ministries, the Ministry of Pastors, the participation and co-responsibility of lay people. So how are we learning about that? You might have seen this back when the uh, Synod was first announced in May 2021. This was the timeline that was published. And I thought at the time that it was a uh, bold and courageous minister uh, that uh, we were going to do a consultation of the whole world, like Caesar Augustus had done a census of the whole world, uh, and then we were going to uh, gather that in dioceses and then nationally and then regionally and so on. And that in itself, and you see that all laid out there in the detail, that in itself was an extraordinarily ambitious project. Look at the... Uh, look at the timeline now. So this is only 18 months later, the end of last year. And the dramatic thing that's been introduced there is this idea of restitution, they're calling it, the, uh, the circularity. If we can try and get over restitution and all its connotations. Restitution in the sense of restoring, giving back to people what they have contributed. So there's the, and it circles within circles, as you can see there. Uh, you know, the people of God, the universal church, the local churches, with critical moments where there are, where there, where there is at a universal level uh, restitution, this circularity. It was a brilliant move. I thought, that before we came to prepare the documents from the various continental assemblies, there was already a gathering together from the national documents, that amazing document, Enlarge the Space of Your Tent. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. You know, it's, it's shocking uh, and moving to hear the recognition uh, that we have been heard, that churches around the people, the people of God across the world have been heard. And that has been, oops, uh, that has been given back to the churches. So we had another process of responding to that. And it was those responses to the international document, which were then considered in preparing the various, uh, the various continental documents. And there'll be a similar process between the two assemblies, where whatever happens in Rome at uh, this October will be returned to the local churches for response and for further discernment to inform the decision making, the decision formalising at the uh, at the second assembly. So there's been a whole learning clearly uh, on the, at the universal level. The process has changed. We're learning this as we're going along. We are getting where the exercise is actually showing some effects. In March, I was uh, an observer at the final assembly of the German Synod Alaveg. And uh, this was their fifth assembly. And in fairness to them, that it, it was set up on quite a different basis from, uh, from our own plenary council and certainly from the synod, on synodality. It uh, began well before that uh, and was seeking to do different, different things. I, I think with hindsight, even they might say that uh, synodal was perhaps not the, the best description for the process and the task that they were setting out that they were setting out to do. Uh, they had very deliberately set up their assemblies in ways that were facing one another, that were, uh, that were to facilitate speaking to one another and hearing one another rather than speaking to the front uh, and arranged the seating strictly in alphabetical order rather than according to uh, according to people's positions and roles and seniority and that facilitated things to to some extent and and in fairness too it's uh, important to be aware that they had four um, forums one on each of their topics uh, operating in between each of their assemblies with about 30 odd um, 
uh, members of the members of the uh, synodal assembly, uh, bishops and and others, and uh, and theologians, and they operated certainly with a whole lot more dialogue. There wasn't much dialogue at the uh, at the uh, the assembly itself, which was operating in only forty eight hours and had a, a large number of documents to consider. So there was a lot of courageous speaking, uh, and um, and a lot. A lot of listening, I think, they still need to do there. Uh, there were a range of other contrasts, I think, between their experience and the, and the the starting point that they were that they were working with from our own experience. But it was for me a dramatic contrast, even just to the layout that we used at the plenary council, and it the way that we set ourselves up physically reflects what we're seeking to do uh, and affects what it's possible for us to do. So what are we trying to do in this synod? We are trying to convert the church to behave synodally, to operate synodally, to renew all our structures and processes so that everyone can participate in this Trinitarian communion that we're baptised into and thereby live out a shared commitment to Jesus' mission. As that document, Enlarge the Space of Your Tent, says, we're learning to walk together and sit together to break the one bread in such a way that each is able to find their place. Everyone is called to take part in this journey. No one is excluded. To this we feel called so that we can credibly proclaim the gospel of Jesus to all people. So what that might that look like, uh, not just on a universal level, but perhaps more locally? Well, I became Bishop of Sandhurst in October 2019, and I was very aware that one of the first thing, one of my first priorities was to establish a diocesan pastoral council. The way that we did that, in fact, took us three and a half years. First of all, we undertook a review uh, with various uh, interviews and consultations with a whole range of people about the whole uh, domain of how we operated the diocese, what our structures were. Uh, one of the recommendations of that review, unsurprisingly, was that we might set up a diocese and pastoral council, a mission and pastoral council, and uh, it talked about the how that might be situated in relation to other decision making bodies and how they in turn might be uh, might be revised and restructured in order to uh, to enhance this. Uh, then, in the middle of last year, we began a process that ran for six months of formal consultation with each of the parishes and uh, most of the secondary schools in our diocese, uh, where Chris and Ruth, who are here today as part of our Mission and Pastoral Life Office, which had been set up after that report was, uh, was finalised, uh, went around to each of our parishes and conducted these preparation and consultation meetings. Uh, reflecting on the document and reflecting reflecting on the, the possibilities of the council, reflecting on uh, and uh, considering what the council might helpfully address. Uh, at the end of that, so in February this year, we conducted an assembly with some 330 people from parishes, schools and agencies, where part of what we did, you can see there if you look carefully, the lady in red, we had some theological input. Uh, that's Alyssa in red on that day. Uh, we, apart from having theological input, we also presented and reflected on what had arisen out of those parish assemblies uh, and said, so this is what you've said. This is what we've heard. And what does that sound like? Uh, and in light of that, what do you suggest gets put forward to the Mission and Pastoral Council for its agenda. So everybody there, uh, uh, as they conducted their reflections, was able to put something forward that will be part of the agenda of the new council and that informed the selection of the members of the council. 
uh, which met for the first time last weekend in Shepparton. Uh, so this was us on Saturday morning in the beautiful, uh, the beautiful weather that also always happens in the Golden Valley. So an instance of, the, uh, of what that might look like. Now it's going to look different in each place, uh, but can you see that circularity and how that can happen? And again, I'm not by nature, a, uh, I like to get on with things. So taking three and a half years, including a year of formal preparation and consultation, that, that's not the first way I would think about doing something. But it has fundamentally shifted, I think, the, uh, the, the, it's affected somewhat the structure, but it's enormously affected the way that people come to this and the, the way that the diocese is engaged with it. So uh, I'm certainly very encouraged by that and very hopeful as we move forward from here. Thank you.